of atonement is one we don't have a real good reference on because we don't use the, name, uh, the word in our culture much, but uh, the idea is something that can be done that will cover over and annul the effect of something that's wrong. Biblical definition maybe gets a little closer to the idea that a third party is called upon to pay the price for a wrong committed by somebody else. Uh, again, I don't, think we, I don't think we use that word. I'm not sure where in popular culture that I could find that word with one exception, and that is Tim McCarver on a Cardinal broadcast, I heard say it one night. He said, well, he said, now we're, he's looking to get a hit here. He's got three men on base, and he's looking to atone for that error he made back in the third inning. I don't know of any other place, and maybe you can think of one, where the culture uses that, that term. But uh, in early scriptures, in the Torah, in the early first five books of the Bible, uh, You'll see the mention often, and the underlying word is a Hebrew word, kapar, and I don't know if that's pronounced right or not, but it's a word that means to cover up, to cancel, to annul, to purge, to reconcile, to take away, um, a, a concept that's always associated with the idea, furthermore, that life offered can cancel out the penalty of a wrong. Uh, atonement was to take place when one sinned and one would bring an animal, if capable, from your flock. And the idea being the innocent animal's life is, is contained in its blood. And if that blood is spilled, it'll pay for the sin of the one who brought the offering. And the offer can then know and be confident that he or she has been made free and purged of the penalty of that sin and that wrongdoing. That's all good, uh, but this isn't, this isn't a minor issue. Uh, I mean, if, if you are a on steroids, rabid animal lover, you might have a problem with a lot of the Old Testament. I mean, there is a lot of animal sacrifice. Amen? I mean, there, there, is, a, there is a lot of blood shed. And it's not just shed once or twice. It's shed often and always. And it's not just for a year or so. It's over and over and over and over again. And it, wasn't, and it wasn't just in this small period of time, but the period of animal sacrifice is a wide, wide-ranging time frame. I mean, Moses put in the system of sacrificial offerings and they basically remained in place. And somebody like Andy that's smart enough to do the math can tell me for a lot of years, but more than just a few hundred. That's your cue, Andy. 1,222. 1,500? Hey, I got 15. I got 15. Who gave me 15 feet? Okay. Now. There is a big deal made of atonement. A special day of atonement. A day when during the Feast of Atonement, the third group of feasts given to Israel, everybody is supposed to stop what they're doing and the priest is supposed to come on the scene with a bull and a ram. The people are to bring through their representative a couple of goats and another bull. And four of these five animals is going to be absolutely massacred 
and torn apart while everybody that's theoretically on holiday is watching. I mean, you know, you, I, just wanna, I just wanna paint this a little bit because I think sometimes because it's not really that well understood and it's not something we relate to in our culture, we kind of just read over that stuff. And he made an offering to the Lord. And he made an offering. Oh, isn't that wonderful? He made an offering to the Lord. But think about this. Dig this. It's, it's a holiday. We don't have to work. Say, Danny, why don't we go down there and see if we can get close enough and maybe even with an offering of our own get inside the courtyard and let's watch the priest do some real damage. He's not only going to kill a few of these animals, but he's going to wait till their blood drains. And he's not just going to wait till their blood drains, but he is going to capture the blood in a bowl because he's got some specific instructions. This blood has to be delivered somewhere specific. Critically, strategically, with his fingers delivered to some very important places, signifying the purification of things that have become really, really defiled because of the ongoing sin of the congregation. This is high church. Daniel and uh, who else? Who chatting with me? Oh, I guess Tom. I was asking him, how long would it take to drain the blood of a live animal after making the first incision? No real answer, but it ain't 15 seconds. It's long enough that it could get a little bit arduous. And it could get a little bit uh, squeamish for somebody who's not good with bloodshed. Serious, serious stuff. Four of the five animals are ultimately going to be, man, I am nowhere near my notes, okay? So when I, like, have to take a break, you guys can greet each other and I'll try to get back to where I'm supposed to be, but... Where was I? So, yeah, so four of these five animals are not only going to be massacred and blood collected, they're going to kind of be pulled apart. I mean, we got some specific instructions here. And those specific instructions are that the innards are to be separated from the outside. And the innards are supposed to be burned on the altar. And these innards are going to smell how? As they're burning? And it even says, and the dung too. And if we haven't done enough separating yet, we got a guy waiting a servant, all tuned up and, 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 and dressed right himself to take the rest of the animal, which was not to be burned there, talking hide, head, bones. And since I don't hunt, I don't know what else comes out. What comes is all his stuff there, all that, all that stuff. Has to be taken out of the camp, removed outside taken outside the camp to be destroyed. Huh. I mean, I just kind of went over the, the overview, guys. If, if you, you want to you wanna look further, there are specific, meticulous instructions to the priest. And that's just this one day of atonement set of sacrifices. There are myriads... And by the way, that sits in the middle of the book of Leviticus. You'll see that next week, I think, on, on some of the material. 
But there are myriads of different sacrifices that there are very specific instructions around. And uh, I'm just like, you know, I'm just a little struck at the idea of how much blood shed over how much time and how many times over and over and over this takes place. This, by the way, is a high day. It's to take place once a year, and you are not going to miss it. This is big-time stuff. It's big-time stuff because the idea of sin in the camp and in the congregation is to be covered and annulled as often as possible, as often even as a worshiper and offerer recognizes it, whether it's on this day or not, to bring an offering. But on this day, we are not just going to atone for those sins known. Israel has become a large group of people. God has camped with them. And he has said, I'm going to be with them. And this group of people probably has lots of unknown, uncovered, and unspoken sin. And this sin, if you read Leviticus 16, you'll find does not just impact the people and one another, which we know that sin does. This sin <laughs> corrupts God's house, his tent the place where his presence is dwelling and wants to dwell and remain is tainted by the sin taking place in the congregation. So the atonement is made not just for the offerers and the people, but every instrument in the temple, the temple itself, and even the holy place is to be sprinkled with blood. You go, wow. What? What is all of that about? Uh, huh. you, see, you see rituals and you kind of kind of go, is, what's this is for? How does this work? You ever have a something that was introduced to you and they say, hey, you got to do it all like this, and you figure the reason why you got to do it like this is for this, but it turns out to be for that. So my, uh, my dad, one summer, just a little after my birthday, I think he waited specifically, introduced to me the ritual of yard mowing. <laughs> it was some real teaching, and it was in detail. Dude, you will check the oil. You will fill it with gasoline. You will look under the housing to see if the grass that you left in there last time is accumulated and it's not going to spit out the side well. And you will check the lawn for the stuff that you and your brothers have left out here. And that includes the baseballs, the tennis balls, the bats, the dog chain. Anybody ever hit a dog chain? Yep, beautiful. Wraps around the hosel. And you want to watch for those little piles. So you check the yard out in advance. If you are walking a walking mower, some of you don't do that anymore. You've seen that John Deere commercial. It ain't how fast you mow. <laughs> you got to love it. Madison Avenue. And I figured this whole deal is so that my dad can come home at night and kick his feet up and I have labored in the heat of the day because I got to play baseball at night. I have labored 
to get this yard looking good. The interesting thing about it was, though it was messy and nasty and the exhaust blew everywhere and that, when you were done, you got kind of like this smooth, even the weeds look good. <laughs> Dig that. When the, when the yard is mowed, even the weeds look good. So I'm like, all right, well, you know, that works. But guess what? In another day or so, you're going to have to do it again. It won't be long, and you will need to do it again. Because what you're doing ain't fixing the situation. It's only keeping it smooth for a little while. Well, what happened to me is the next summer, I got an opportunity to do a couple of yards. And uh, there was a professor from the University of Illinois. And my dad told me, because he was not an educated man, that professors had college degrees and they made a whole bunch of money. And Mr. McGlamory would probably pay me handsomely if I would take care of his grass while he was on sabbatical. He was actually in another country doing research for University of Illinois. And, and Mr. Mr. Uh, McGlamory did pay me handsomely. And I had a good year that summer. I made a lot of money in my world, you know, because my alternative was going down to the, to the golf course finding the golf balls that the guys had hooked out on number nine, picking them up, walking down to the tee, and selling them back to the next golfers. <laughs> Making nigh on to buck 52, sometimes three bucks a week. I was in high cotton when I got the yard deal done. What I found out in the end, with this set of ceremonies, ended up being good, not just for my dad, but for me. Say, well, how does that fit? I don't know, but it's supposed to. So you try really, really hard to make this work, all right? So the granddaddy of all offerings, Leviticus 16, the Day of Atonement, imagine that. Uh, what the heck? What the heck? Animal sacrifices, right? So... Uh, I think we're tainted by the idea because what is our real reference point in our culture? I mean, how many of you encounter it at all except if you just heard about it in some gory movie or the secular witchcraft uh, covens that, that I still operate around our country? Uh, you really don't have any decent frame of reference to plug that in. Uh, but what we see here is that this is not a set of pagan sacrifices that was meant to fix the God who evidently was really torqued. This was a set of sacrifices to cleanse the mind and free the mind of the offerer and to give him reason why he can stay near to the presence of God, a holy and pure God who otherwise he had no business in company with. Where we're at in the story here is that God has rescued the Israelites from Egypt, right? And he's come to kind of declare who he is. And he's cut covenant with them through Moses. And he said, look, this is who I am. I'm the God that fixed you guys. I'm the God that rescued you from that slavery. And here's the deal. Walk before me and live like this. And they said, yeah, we're all for that. We're good. But the rebellious heart continued to get in the way. And so these ceremonial sacrifices were added as God saw that he's going to need more ammunition on his side, on their side of the covenant because they and their rebellious behaviors were not seeming to be tamed even though they said they're going to live differently. 
this set of ceremonial offerings made it so that a God who always wanted to live among them, lead them and care for them and be their God and have a people that he could call his own, could do so. Temporarily, the book of Hebrews says, temporarily, interesting. What we ultimately find out is that something's wrong. Something's wrong with the covenant, and it's not on God's side. Amen? Jeremiah and Isaiah put it pretty succinctly. They say, hey, look, guys, y'all been at this for a number of years, and what we've observed is this. God says, you draw near to me with your sacrifices, but your heart is far from it. Hearkening back to something that Moses told him as he was signing off in Deuteronomy 30. And that is, look, there's going to have to come a day when God can circumcise and does indeed come and circumcise your hearts. Because what I'm watching and what y'all been through, this is not going to work very long. So there are hints that there's a little decay, and the decay around the whole topic is the idea that the heart still hasn't been cha changed. And the offerer's rebellion continues even though the sacrifices in the sacrif sacrificial system continue to be observed. Have you ever known that to happen? A place where like the action's all there, but the heart is far away from it. Have you found that in your own heart at all? Have you ever found that, you know, okay, so it's, uh, you know, it's time to worship, and I'm worshiping, and be like, I'm thinking, whoa, I got a lot to do on Tuesday. Mm-hmm. That happened. Well, here's the deal. This system provides a way for the children of Israel to continue to travel along with a God who wanted to dwell among them and with them. But the problem found in their heart was going to have to be dealt with. This bunch of rescued folks could show their incredible capacity to continue in their rebellion regardless of how good he had been to them. Ever have that? Mm. The idea really is that sin is viral, just to use a, a different term. That sin is contagious and passes on from person to person. And if you, if you, if you kind of just reference back to Genesis 3 through 11 for a second, think about, okay, we have a fall here. And just a few passages later, what, what do we see happening? A murder, right? Cain slays Abel. We get a few we get a few. Ways down the road and we see that the earth becomes to the point where God's saying, I'm, I'm kind of repenting that I, that I put man in the earth and this kind of thing. And, and the flood comes. That doesn't solve the problem. Ultimately, Babylon takes place and, and rebellion is, is uh, so rampant and among a group that God scatters the people. So the idea that sin is viral... It introduces garbage into God's good creation, stands behind 
the set of ceremonial laws and sacrifices and ultimately all God does to remedy things. So what's the answer? Well, look, the biblical answer is the idea that someone has to step in on our behalf. Uh, you might think that the sacrifices would be successful. You might think, gosh, wouldn't you, after the point, watch an innocent animal bleed to death? That you, wouldn't you think you'd go home and say, well, man, that's, that's the product of my sin? And uh, we could look at that same truth today, New Covenant, say, ooh. His death on the cross, my sin, ooh, would that not change a heart? You think, well, maybe the system would, uh, would convince them that their debt was paid and that they could do kind of a fresh start thing, and uh, no, it doesn't work. But nevertheless... The sacrificial system put on display the love of God. And his love issued toward a people called to be his own. And the prophets made it really clear that the problem was bad and it wasn't going away. Isaiah comes on the scene and he prophesies of another king. A king that ultimately would pay a sacrifice. A suffering king. And this pointed to Jesus. So church, here it is. All things surrounding all of the sacrifices, day of atonement and otherwise, Point forward to Jesus, the one all-time, full-time, complete and for all sacrifice. Book of Hebrews 9, 11 to 15. Christ came as a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. Tabernacle not made with hands, not a tent, the writer says. It's not of a building. Neither by the blood of bulls and goats, calves, but by his own blood, he entered into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us. The blood of bulls and goats, ashes, ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, worked to purify the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself, without spot to God, how much will that purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause, he's the mediator of a new covenant. That by means of his death, the redemption of the transgressions, even that were under the first. They which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. See, when we read the Old Testament, we, we, we almost always can get that glimpse and that picture But you come away, especially living on this side of the cross and knowing there's more. We're kind of cheaters when we look at it. I mean, the people that are living in that day believing God are like going, do do, do this, this, I see it, and I'm looking for it, and I know his promise is coming. Today, we look back at that and we go, yeah, it just seems a little bit incomplete, you know? Uh, We knew something wasn't quite complete when we look at those when we look at those rituals. And we're correct. Because the ultimate sacrifice, the one to which all others point, 
hadn't yet been delivered. And it all pointed to him in a day when obedience, in addition to forgiveness, could be made possible. <laughs> Not just forgiveness, but ultimately, he would wash us. As we studied a couple months ago, and I think Tom preached it, he'd gather us and wash us and give us a new heart and cause us to walk in his ways. So the problem of the heart ultimately gets dealt with. This sacrifice did more than pay a penalty. This sacrifice didn't stay dead. This sacrifice rose from the dead, evidencing that this was the end that the power of sin had now been broken. Hallelujah. So the penalty was paid and the power of sin is broken. The tomb is empty. The law of sin and death is overcome. Hmm. His death demonstrated much, but one thing is on display, and that is the heart of the God we know. He's one who rescues what and who he loves from its own corruption, though even the corruption itself is something that's foreign to him. The idea of atonement, as we talk about it these next couple of weeks, is at the very core of what God's done for us. It is not for him. It is done by him. The penalty is taken on him. And what he has done, he has done for us. The innocent... Paying the price for the guilty. Hmm. The sacrificial ritual we could never figure out. And I don't know yet you always questioned it. What the heck is it for? Ultimately, I find it expresses the beautiful display of the character of a God who created a good world desired a people in whom he could share his wonderful self with, making them fully human. And when it became defiled, he never wavered from his plan, which he knew before the foundation of the earth, to restore all that's in it back into his son who created it from the start. So, I'd tell you, brothers, sisters, exhort one another and comfort one another with the reality that their penalty is paid. That the power of sin to dominate them is broken. And then, exhort them in something else. The presence of sin will someday be removed by this same relentless God who has intended from the beginning to have a creation wherein he will dwell in a people and they in him. And that's the gospel. So we're going to look at that a little more next week. You guys, you, guys, uh, you guys dig into that a little bit. And uh, bring questions. Woody will have all the answers. Or is it Tim will have all the answers? Or, or are we going to put Rob on the spot next week?
Rob is ducking underneath the amp back there as I speak. Stand to your feet. <laughs>